for kind of conversation tonight. I think you're going to love it. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. We're shutting down the issues conversation for this evening, which we do occasionally on, on Friday evenings. As uh, many of you know, we record our Friday evening programs slightly early in the week, usually on Thursdays. This one was recorded on Monday, just in case we slip up on the day, because, you know, it's tough for everyone to keep track of their lives, including me, especially after a weekend. But uh, this, this honor flight project that has been going on here in the state is really something special, and it is our pleasure tonight to honor uh, the work that's being done and to talk about it and to let everybody know that you can help them participate always in these kinds of events and support them. So uh, that's our gig for this Friday evening. Here's a headline that kind of describes what has already just taken place. And this was a special event in that uh, it was unique for women this time around. Mike Montecavo will explain that along with George Farrell, who used to run the fire department around here and now uh, runs these programs. Here is one of the stories that ran to set the foundation for the conversation tonight. I had the opportunity to be a part of an historic honor flight where 44 female veterans were taken to the nation's capital to visit the memorials dedicated to their service. The female veterans spanned in age from 35 to 95 and served in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, or Afghanistan. After a thunderous send-off at Green Airport in Warwick, they were greeted by total strangers in D.C., including decorated war veteran, retired Senator Bob Dole. Each memorial bringing back memories to the veterans who served. Jeannie, you served in the Vietnam War era. What does it mean to come here and see the names on the wall? It means a lot. Half of my class, men in the uh, high school class, all joined the service and got drafted and they all died. So we don't hold a high school reunion uh, out of respect for them. Jeannie also tells me even though decades have gone by, seeing the soldiers' names brings back memories. Well, I'll tell you, that, that, that hits you in the gut, Mike and George. Welcome, guys. Thank nice you. Nice to have you. That they don't have a high school reunion. You know, that's 10 years, so she's about 10 or 12 years older than I am. I'm class of 79. But back in the 60s, all hell was breaking loose, and kids were going like crazy. You know, I was just a little one when Vietnam was, was happening. But that, wow, they've lost so many. They've lost so many, and, and in fact, Korean War veterans, uh, well, Vietnam War veterans are dying faster than Korean War veterans, given, given that their ages are 10, 15 years older than the Korean because War. Of because of what they dealt with out there. Yeah. Um, some of the things that they dealt with while they were there. Most of the veterans that we're taking, uh, we focus more, mainly on World War II and now Korea. Uh, we take our oldest and most senior veterans first, and we have taken some, uh, Mike's been with us, we have taken some Vietnam era veterans, um, generally if they were in hospice, uh, we would put them onto a flight, but we would only take one or two at a time. Uh, this flight we had probably about 10 uh, veterans of Vietnam, quite a few nurses who served several tours at any of that hospitals. All right, so let's, let's talk about the project in general, then we'll talk about how special this last, this, this last one was. Talk to me, Bill. So this, this began when? Well, I, uh, I actually saw the greeting that you saw in the video uh, coming home from a vacation with my family, and that was back around 2010. I was chief in province at the time, and I was past president of the Chiefs Association. I came back, and I kept thinking about that, thinking about my, uh, uh, my dad, who had passed away by then, but he was a World War II veteran, Purple Hot Bronze Star. He would go to his ship reunions every so often, and I thought, boy, that would have been nice for him to have that, that kind of um, welcome this many years later. I mean, you know, and, uh, couldn't stop thinking about it, came back, went to the board of directors meeting the following month and told them about what I saw and thought if, uh, told them if no one's doing that, I think we should. And uh, so I went out, redid the research, found uh, Honor Flight Network, that's what that was that I saw. Uh, took, us, took me about a year to get it together. Uh, Petition then. You saw that happening at Green Airport? Uh, no, I saw it in Baltimore. Oh, okay. I was, so was out home. of town. Get you, got you, got you. Came back and thought we should do that. Uh, okay. Dave Sales, who was the president of our association then, combat veteran infantry in Vietnam, um, he was all for it. And uh, 
we worked for about a year, year and a half to get a 501c3, get affiliated with, actually get affiliated with a 501c3 then, um, and get it off the ground. Took our first flight in November of 2012. We announced it five weeks later, we took a flight. How long have you been involved, Mike? So I went, my first trip was last September. And this was a story, Dan, that I've always wanted to do. I, uh, I know a couple of people who went on it. They said it was great for their fathers. Their fathers were World War II vets, so they were in their 90s. So it was kind of like on my bucket list. Mm -hmm. And you do this 38 years, towards the end, it's like, okay, there's a couple of more stories I want to do. And they told me about what, their, how it, what it meant to their fathers. And I said, I want to be a part of this. I want to tell this story. Because you don't really know until you're there. And for anybody, just show up at the airport at 5 o'clock in the morning the day they leave and you'll get the idea of sure. what, it's, what it's about. So we did that one. We went into September. And when we were there, uh, Senator Reid said, you know they're going to do an all-female flight uh, in the spring. And I told Chief Farrell, I said, I want in on that one too. Mm -hmm. And we went. And the two diff there were totally, totally two different, different stories. Uh, where the gentlemen were, we had a couple of female on that one too, but yeah. the gentlemen were more quiet. They were just taking it in. They really didn't talk about the war. They were talking well, about isn't it that, isn't that it really, I'll tell you, the Korean War specifically, that you get very little, uh, I mean, there's, uh, there's so few veterans left, but uh, within the last 20 years, I have been uh, exceptionally close to a couple of Korean War veterans, and I get nothing, yeah. absolutely nothing. Why? Well, I think uh, in World War II, in many cases, they were like that. My dad didn't say much about it till, till towards the end. And uh, I often joke with all of the veterans that I'm around, which is frequently I'm around them, that I don't know how we won any war because they all tell you they didn't do anything. Um, and, and then you find out they have a silver staff and gallantry at the Battle of the Bulge. The humility that of that chosen. generation, the greatest oh, yeah. generation, as Brokaw uh, wrote about, is, is just uncanny, right? Uncanny. But even, even down the line, there, there seems to be not only a humility that's built into the service uh, in combat, because clearly they rely on each other so much that their own identity seems to, that they suppress it, but there's also a bunch of stuff that they've seen and they just won't talk about. Yeah, well, they know the horrific nature of war. You know, they've seen it. And Korean War veterans, I, you know, most of us, like me, I'm you know, a few years older than you, is, is that uh, you know, we all learned about World War II. It was well publicized, it was well documented, it has been since. Korea, not so much. So now as we're taking Korean War veterans, we're starting to find out a lot more about them, a lot more about their service. You know, when you're, when you're at the Iwo Jima Memorial, for the Marine Memorial, and you're talking to them, you say, well, you know, I'm sorry, it's kind of cold today. Well, this isn't cold, son. You know, cold is that the bullet wound freezes, and that's how you survived, because it was minus 25 below where they were fighting, particularly the Marines in the Chosin Valley. I interviewed Roger Messier when we went in September. Yeah. We went to the Korean Memorial. That's the uh, war he was in. And his job was putting, getting dog tags and putting it in victims' mouths. And I asked him what was that like, and he got very emotional. He said, all I kept thinking about was, that was somebody's son, that was somebody's husband. And I said, you really made a difference in people's lives. And he said, I didn't realize it then, but I do now. And he opened up for the first time, mm. you know. So it's yeah, goosebumps actually when yeah. you're thinking about something like that, and when you're there with them. So. When we come back, we'll expand uh, the coverage of this latest uh, uh, latest event, which was very very special. Be right back. So here's a here's a, a little bit more in depth uh, discussion of Mike's uh, piece on this incredible event. Honor Flight Victory, being greeted at the World War II Memorial by Rhode Island Senator Jack Reed and retired Senators Bob and Elizabeth Dole. After 9-11, we appreciated the dangers that we faced and the brave men and women that were protecting us. What an honor to, for me today to meet these heroes, what they've done for this country, protecting our freedom and our security. And this is a part of the history that must be preserved. After several stops, the Marine Memorial. Why is this memorial close to your heart? Well, number one, I was a Marine. I think it's important that we never forget those who sacrificed everything for us. Nancy Perney remembering six local Marines who made the ultimate sacrifice since 2000 and the person who shaped her life. They all have white roses and there's one red rose 
for my dad, who was a Marine, and he was the first Marine that I ever loved. This has been a tremendous day, and I'm so grateful that I get to honor these Marines that sacrificed so much, especially fellow Marine Corporal Holly Charette. Our trip has made several stops, including a memorial for Iwo Jima, but now a more somber visit, Arlington National Cemetery. This week, what's the day when remain silent? and standing during this ceremony. The two oldest honor flight veterans of the trip, Rosie DeRochers and Madeline Gray, laying the wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier. A vivid reminder, not all soldiers returned home. Rosie served in the Coast Guard, Madeline in the Army in World War II. Both are now 95, Madeline still wearing the shirt she wore on the final day of her enlistment. My two bars, I still have them and the caduceus is new and this was on my husband's uniform so if you didn't leave would you yeah. have been a general someday if you didn't leave the <laughs> i wanted to be you wanted to i be said a i was going to be the first woman general activist rosa parks once said each person must live their life as a model for others on behalf of a grateful nation thank you women played a very integral role an important role in any job that they did, whether it be combat or not, very, very important. Good question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. She, uh, she's, you could talk to her all day. Oh, she is very sharp. Uh, she didn't want to leave. She was getting married. So back then, if you were getting married, you had to leave the military. And so that's why she was out. So that's why I was teasing her that she could have been a general mm. someday. Incredible. But the women, an exclusive trip for these women, why? We had been taking flights. We had taken by this flight was our 22nd uh, in the last six years or so. And uh, we realized, that, you know, as we, we were organizing these, we weren't getting too many women to come out uh, and take the flights, one or two here or there. Um, and I, I thought, it was my opinion, that they weren't coming because they, maybe they thought they had to be in combat or that, you know, for whatever reasons, they just weren't, weren't putting their applications in. And it's, you know, it, it wasn't uncommon for us to take men who were not in combat. And my feeling was, the Chief's feeling was, if, if you enlisted, if you were drafted, however it was that you got to the military, your service was valuable. Not everybody went to combat in World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam. These women, in many cases, were, there were a lot of nurses, so they provided a valuable role, uh, served a valuable role during the wars that they were in. So we uh, I, I, I got introduced to a woman, um, uh, uh, Leach, Karen Leach, from the General Federation of Women's Club, and I pitched the idea that if they wanted to sponsor the flight, I would organize a flight, and the uh, Chiefs would have all female veterans, which would have been about 25, and then we did a fundraiser with a group of women at the uh, uh, the beauty lounge at Magnolia and Cranston and raised uh, an additional amount of money so all of the guardians could be veterans as well. That's why we had such a range from 35 to 96 years old. Usually most of our, our groups are 80s and 90s uh, and the veterans are family guardians, I should say, are family members or um, you know, fire chiefs who have EMP. So. Uh, on both the, 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 ma the male and female side, the men and the women, uh, when, when, they're, when they're notified that they're, <laughs> they're eligible for this trip, there must be some incredible human stories just in terms of their reaction. Yeah, the, the phone calls are great. Because it comes it comes out of, do they have to apply for it? Yeah, you fill out an application, you go to our website, www.rionaflight.com. Okay. That's simple, send in an application. We take them first come, first serve. You know, I'll get, get a call. I'm guessing up. families do it on behalf of their, of their send moms and grandparents right. and that kind of a thing no. for the most part, right? Right. And they, we just, we put it in a file. As your, your application comes in, you go in the back of the World War II file. So we tell them you have to put it in because everyone's old. They'll tell me they're old. They'll tell me this. And yeah, that's everybody's old. Everybody's got problems. That's not the, the main issue. The main issue to get it in so we can get you out onto a flight. And George, do you call them personally? I, yeah, I did. Uh, I did almost all of the flights, almost every call. I ran this out of my house for five years. What, what an incredible project you're doing here. It, it, the, the, uh, you got to have some 
either moving or funny stories about phone well, calls that you've made to some well, of these folks and say, oh my gosh, I get to do that, holy cow. Well, yeah, I mean, once, once they stop hanging up on me, sometimes I have to make a call <laughs> to the next of kin, the alternate contact, to get them to say, don't hang up on me. And, you know, and I can understand why, because I do. I hang up on almost anybody who calls me. Uh, well, you know, the, you know it's true. These yeah. days, I mean, how many robocalls you get in right. a day? Constantly. You can nonstop. Right. Right. And, you, and you have to be very cautious. I am, and I am in the chief's head. We're very cautious about the information we let out, because there are people who will prey on elderly people, and that's who we're, we're servicing and taking. So we're very controlling about um, everything that happens with this flight. There's nothing that goes on. Mike's been with us. There's, this is... It's, it's mechanical at this point. We, we run everything by the numbers. And for somebody who thinks, you know, my mom and dad can't go because they have health yeah. issues, uh, the volunteers that Chief Farrell has is well, incredible. There are plenty of wheelchairs. I mean, there's obviously yeah. there's, there's a lot of TLC that surrounds yeah. getting these folks from here to there and back. Well, yeah, you think about taking the transition from being in the fire service where most of us, all of us are EMTs, some are paramedics, uh, physician's assistant, the chief that we take. Uh, Tim Walsh is a physician's assistant. So we have a, a core group of people, there's always a half a dozen, who have that skill. So all of us develop those skills in public service, and we got to take transition that skill and level of training and take that into taking veterans who some of the other honor flights might not take. You know, we've, we've worked in unsanitized atmospheres in the communities that we live in. So having somebody who needs to carry down a set of stairs, uh, like happened on this flight or, or, yeah. or anything else, doesn't really phase us. And they get to the airport, a green airport. Now, Director Kasim Yaren told me, he goes, this is going to be a big thing. And Chief Farrell said, you don't know it until you show up at green airport. There must have been about 300 people there, military, total strangers. They were following us, for example, Dan, on social media. So when we came back, there was a group of about 10 women that had no personal connection showed up as they wanted to meet the veterans. Mm -hmm. So this story really touches uh, a lot of people. So. You know, and it's generosity. I mean, people, whether it's there, you know, I always say, you, it's great what we do. We can't do that without resources. So we get uh, generous uh, people who will donate to sponsor a flight like this one that was both veterans and guardians. Just to take the veterans was about $15,000. So you have to raise that kind of revenue to begin with, and then all the smaller donations that you get or whatever it is you do. So as Mike knows, I'm out, I'm out constantly, you know, trying to raise the revenue to make it happen. The chiefs are out there. But I have a great... Uh, you know, there's, there's people who volunteer their time. A gentleman who's now on our board, Al Peterson, retired uh, North Providence fire captain, has a business on the Antic Avenue, uh, American Safety Program, the training. He gave me a, a he gave me an office storage space, and I have 50 wheelchairs in the back of the building that arise. So, you know, we went from out of my home, and that's now my home where I where I operate. You know, phone systems, everything. He just gives it to us. So that's you know that's that's great stuff when you get people to do that for a job lot, Ocean State job lot. Every single flight I shop in their stores, buying the pens, plastic bags, ponchos, umbrellas, all of those things that we will need for supplies on these flights. So, what a project. Now we'll talk about what it's like to thank veterans when we come back. Stay with us. Yeah, this is, this is you, frankly, it's this kind of video. Mike, that you guys shot and you know George produces with the event that you could just kind of watch all day. If you have a bad day, you just kind of just kind of look at this stuff. You know, the, I, I'll never forget uh, the first Gulf War, um, and the troops were coming home, and I was in Western Mass at the time, and they came in Chicopee, and they came in all night, and it was kind of like a, a it was a a thing where the, the general public just was at the hangar and you know uh, the soldiers were, were all coming in and they were just shocked because they were just transitioning in Chicopee at, at, uh, at uh, Westover. Uh, Westover is in, in Westfield. Um, anyway, in Chicopee, Mass. And, and, and the hangar's got you know the music, the patriotic music on, and they're all, and there's gifts and, and they're all just like, wait a second, I'm just going to Sioux City. You know, just mm -hmm. and but that's fresh off their service. That's when they are young. When we think about thanking because they're fresh back. Of course, Vietnam still suffers from a lack of thanks, right? And so that's got to be special when you treat those folks. But at this level, um, I mean, it's not. It doesn't take much to when you find someone says that they served to, to just respond, "Thank you for your service." This is the ultimate project, George. This is a. Uh 
It's well, you know, I describe it sometimes. But think about taking your mother or father, who's 90 years old, down to George's in Galilee or Iggy's for clam cakes and chowder on a Sunday afternoon. Think about taking 25, 50, 143 people out. You know, many of you have only met once for a couple of hours a few weeks before. It's an incredible amount of responsibility um, to, to to take that on, and then you watch. And, and Mike's been with us, so you watch as their day goes on from. When, at 5 a.m. when they're not really sure, you know, I mean, we've, we've told them it's going to be a 17-hour day. They're not sure that they can make it. Um, we have to take their medications, their wheelchairs, their oxygen, whatever it is they need. And, and, and it can literally run a full trauma code if it was necessary for us to be able to do that while we were on the road. Mm. And so you think about that kind, of, uh, that kind of responsibility. But you watch them from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. The end of the day is a different, a different story. Uh, because? Because. Because now they see that people appreciate them, especially mm -hmm. the Vietnam War the veterans. Thing. Well, they talked about when they came home that people were spitting on them, that okay. they didn't honor right. their service, and now it's they get to time see in this. Our history. They get you'll see in our five o'clock piece. Uh, waiting for them as soon as they're getting off the plane in uh, at Reagan is uh, General Nadia West, the Surgeon General. She's waiting for them. She talks about she's in the military today because of the women coming off this plane. It's power, and she talked to every single person. Bob Dole. Was in our five o'clock story. And too. Bob looks, you know, Bob is ninety-five. Five. Obviously, the, the, his physicality is is severely diminished, but he's still all there. He, uh, yeah. All so there. we speak to him uh, in the first piece. He goes almost every time. He, by the way, he just, uh, uh, Mrs. Dole told me he had just gotten out of the hospital. Yeah. And he wanted to be there because he knew this was the, f you mm -hmm. know, the first all-female honor flight. And he was there, so they don't know who's going to be there. You got a chance to, to there. speak with him, which is rare. Yeah, Beautiful. rare. Like he didn't speak when President Bush uh, died, uh, but um, thanks to Senator Reid, we were able to talk to him. Um, All right, so clear this up for me because we only got a minute or so. The the coverage or these stories that we're seeing. This is taping for Friday. You're running these stories when? So, so we, they've already aired, but they're on WPRI.com okay, okay, right now. Okay. So there's uh, two different versions. The five o'clock piece where Senator Dole is in. That's almost four minutes long. But what we also did then was we had so much. So we've put uh, web only interviews. So General West is on there. Awesome. Senator Dole. Uh, Senator Do uh, Elizabeth Dole, she wants to build a uh, female um, memorial mm -hmm. down in Washington. She talks about that. Gotcha. And um, so it's, um, it's quite unique. It well, listen, terrific journalism. Thank Again, you. go to WPRI.com and you can just enjoy at your leisure. Great thing about the web, right? Enjoy it all. Uh, George, obviously you're always raising money, right? So always. for people to contribute to this cause, they simply go to? www.rionaflight.com. There's a button right there to make a donation. You can do it online. You can call us at 401-354-7905. Stop in where our office is on 150 Niantic Avenue in Providence. Uh, we're always available. We're always out. We're happy to come out and speak to any organizations. I am. I do it often. But we got a flight June 1st that's already full. We're ready to go. We're flying out again September uh, uh, 14th uh, again. So we have on a flight whiskey. We name them. Go through the phonetic alphabet. Worked out great because it's McShawn's Pub who sponsored the flight. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then on a flight X-ray in September, which is uh, Pappas Physical and Hand Therapy. So people are out there. I go in for physical therapy. Right. I come out with a check uh, to <laughs> run an auto flight. So but all that information, by the way, is on. Our, will be on our web at foxprovidence.com too, so you can catch up. Congratulations and God bless Thank you for this work, George. It's unbelievable. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. And our final word, and we come back. Stay with us. You want to talk about a project uh, from scratch? Uh, George Farrell has got. Uh, well, a second legacy, no doubt about it. Again, foxprovidence.com to link to all of those places where you can help donate or make a plan to have a veteran in your family have a non-flight. Have a great weekend. Thanks for tuning in. Talk to you Monday at 3 on WPRO. Good night.